Hello, hi guys. Um, this is Arif Rahman uh, coming to live with you uh, via Facebook Live. Uh, today we are going to talk about um, a new book um, that Ali A. Rizvi uh, from Canada, um, who's um, trying to actually introduce a new concept with us um, called Atheist Muslim. The book is called The Atheist Muslim. Um, Ali has been uh, as an activist uh, in in American kind of hemisphere for a few years now, and he's quite a well-renowned um, activist. And uh, I think uh, he's originally uh, his his uh, parents are from Pakistan, but I think he was born and brought up in in Pakistan. We'll hear a lot more uh, from him. And um, if you can hold off your questions for say uh, first uh, first half an hour. And then we'll take some questions or comments so that we can talk about it. So um, I'm going to do a quick sound check uh, in a second when we go live uh, with Ali and then we'll take it from there. Hi, Ali. How are you? Hi, Arif. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, thank you so much for uh, making time. Uh, I know it's um, kind of uh, weekend come running up to Christmas and everybody's quite busy with lots of different things. Um, so I'm just going to yeah. do a quick sound check and see how it's going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. We can hear all of you. So first of all, uh, again, thank you so much for making the time. And uh, thank you for your uh, efforts that you put in um, to actually um, the, the community that, um, you know, as I am an atheist, uh, that actually don't like us generally, but we are still trying to reform the, the community. Um, so first question, I would ask the obvious question about the title of the book. Um, uh, in in my uh, blog, uh, sorry, in my video title, I've said uh, atheist and Muslim is an interesting um, a kind of uh, term. And uh, how, what made you think about that? And if you can explain to us a little bit about the kind of the basics of the book, uh, what, what is it about? So um, the, the term atheist Muslim is not as much a self descriptor. It's not something that necessarily describes me as much as it is a play on the role of uh, identity and ideology, the role of ideology that comes into identity generally in the Muslim world. So this happens usually in uh, pretty much all religions, but in uh, most Muslim countries, and especially the people that I've corresponded with in the Muslim world, and there have been thousands of them over the last uh, seven or eight years, as you probably know. Um, they, the religion is such a huge part of their lives. It's not just in the governments and in their constitutions, but it's also in their communities and their societies and their families, um, even as, as part of their own identity. So there are many people who actually, the, the, the idea of the Muslim identity is very different uh, today than the idea of Islamic ideology. And uh, one example I like to give to illustrate this is an article that uh, Fareed Zakaria wrote. So Fareed Zakaria is a, a renowned American journalist who was uh, um, originally from India. And uh, after Donald Trump announced uh, his uh, ban, a temporary ban on Muslims last, uh, pretty much, I think about a year ago, uh, Fareed Zakaria wrote an article called I Am a Muslim, uh, Embracing the Muslim Identity, the Washington Post. Now, if you read the article, he says, I'm a non-practicing Muslim. Like, my beliefs are closer to deism and agnosticism. Um, he said that he hasn't been to a mosque in decades. His wife is Christian. He hasn't raised his children as Muslims. Uh, but he feels he has to embrace his identity because of what he's seeing in the political climate today. So I have actually noticed that there are many people who, especially in the Muslim world, because the costs of leaving the term Muslim are so high, um, uh, they tend to want to keep a little bit of a foot in the door. Because when you're asking them to change their minds, and when you're talking to them and they're considering stepping out of the Islamic ideology, uh, they still... They, they often end up being disowned from their families. They can be uh, ostracized from their uh, societies and uh, they can even be executed and put in jail by their governments or killed by mobs, as, as you well know, with uh, the stories of uh, Bangladeshi bloggers just like you uh, that have been, we've been seeing like the headlines uh, all over the world. So um, this is basically a play on that, on the idea of separating Islamic ideology from Muslim identity 
and being able to criticize the ideology of Islam without demonizing uh, all Muslims because um, ideas don't have rights, human beings do. So uh, that, that was essentially uh, the, 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 the running theme of the book. So the book is a very, um, uh, it's a strong critique of Islam as a religion. It's a strong critique of the idea of faith. Uh, it's a strong critique of religion in general and dogmatic beliefs. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it also asks for, like, you know, when we communicate with people who are religious, communicate with people who are Muslim, uh, we must understand the cost that they have to pay uh, to let go of it. It's not as simple as changing your mind. In the book, I say that um, in in this kind of world, in a lot of the Muslim world, simply changing your mind can mean losing your head. Uh, so there are many obstacles that are much more complicated than just the rationality aspect uh, that uh, that uh, young uh, Muslims go through as they begin to leave the faith of their parents. So th this is essentially a book that uh, that discusses that and explores it. Obviously, this book was um, released in the America a couple of months ago. Yeah, it was. It came out November twenty second in the U.S. and and UK. It was released literally last week. Um, so far, what sort of reactions and uh, acceptance you've received so far? Uh, it's been actually amazing. I didn't. Uh, it's been more than I thought. I mean, I've been I've been writing for many years now, so and I do have a strong social media platform. So that you know that's happened, uh, but um, I've received a lot of messages. Uh, I've been doing a lot of podcasts, and and we haven't even actually. Uh, properly done a lot of media or uh, you know media coverage a lot of reviews haven't even come out yet so much of the publicity still has to is still pending will probably happen around january february um but uh, even uh, despite all of that right now um the response has been really really interesting and there's you know a lot of people the the first thing they do is they start talking about the title uh which is somewhat deliberate and it's intended because it gets a conversation going exactly. and um uh, I, I wanted that to happen. I, I, I kind of wanted to uh, people to look at the title and be, you know, they're like, what does that mean? That doesn't even make sense. It's an oxymoron. And then when they <laughs> actually do read the book, they'll realize that uh, it really is what I'm getting to, where I'm talking about how uh, vacuous these labels are anyway. You know, mm -hmm. that there's this idea that a Muslim is someone who believes in Islam uh, and then, you know, the, the ISIS says they're true Muslims. And then, you know, the um, uh, Ahmadis say that, you know, they're the true Muslims and the Shia say they're the true Muslims and Sunni say they're the and so on. So everybody's sort of uh, discrediting the other person. And, and if you look at it that way, in that way, nobody's really a true Muslim in that sense. So um, and then you have the Fareed Zakaria definition, which is, uh, you know, I'm non-practicing. I don't really believe in it, but, you know, I'm embracing the identity because um the people of my family, my friends, the people I grew up with, these are all people are being demonized in front of me. Uh, so I feel like I must embrace it. So there, there's, uh, it's, it's very interesting, this is just this, the word Muslim and how toxic it's become in a way and the wide variety of connotations that it has. Uh, so I, I thought that would be interesting. And, you know, you have feminist Muslims, you have LGBT Muslims, you have all of these people, and um, they seem like contradictions. You know, I had a conversation with a friend once said uh, she was a feminist Muslim. And I said, have you read the Quran? Have you seen all of the misogynistic stuff that's in there? And she said, yeah, but, you know, everybody cherry picks. So I asked her, I'm like, well, can I cherry pick all the way to non-belief? How do I, uh, you know, can I sort of keep Ramadan and, you know, the feasts of Ramadan, all the good food and the Eid celebrations and the tax-exempt status and uh, then, you know, just keep that and discard all the rest and that way I could be an atheist Muslim. Uh, so a part of it was tongue-in-cheek as well. So... Uh, it's uh, it's been an interesting kind of fun title, and the reaction has been uh, really interesting to it too, as well. It's very good to know. Um, obviously, um, I, I don't know how many of uh, uh, you know v viewers actually watching us now. How many of they um, know me? Um, uh, the reason I'm saying this is because uh, I, I at the beginning I said you are a um, you are born and raised in in the, the North American subcontinent, so. Um, you may not have that uh, kind of, you know, you may not have lived in Pakistan that long enough. But compared to that, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, I, sorry, I just wanted to, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I actually wanted to correct that. I actually lived in Libya, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan until okay. I was 24. 
Right. So I came here when I was well into my 20s in Canada, but I grew up largely. I was born in Pakistan. My parents were originally born in India. Uh, when uh, the, the first few years of my life I spent in Libya, then about 10, 11 years I lived in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And then I was in Pakistan for another you oh, know, okay. 10 that, years or that so. That explains the and, interest, actually, yeah. to, to try to, to make it better. Okay, sorry, my, my apologies. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't... Um, Nope. read that about because all i did is um kind of assumed from your accent that you have such a good accent you you must be born here which is a kind of simplification from my point so the reason i was going to say there isn't much of a difference then in that case because i um came moved to uk around 25 when i was 25 and you can hear that i have a really strong accent you know it's not a proper english accent i have but um uh the reason I'm saying this is because, um, well, I'm actually from Bangladesh originally. So I grew up and I was kind of born and raised in Bangladesh up until I moved to UK. Um, and my perspective to this whole um, Muslim identity, and I was only hit by it when I came here. And then I started realizing that the Bangladeshi diaspora that was actually migrated here a couple of generations ago, they don't have the Bangladeshi, um, or if we spread it, uh, Pakistani or any Indian identity left in them. Indians may still have some identity, but the, anybody who had some Muslimness in them, they became more and more Arabized or Saudiized. I don't know what to call them, but they started calling them Muslims. And um, I can see the same trend kind of happening everywhere. Anybody who's migrated from those continents moved to a different culture. For some reason, they started becoming more and more, in their terms, Muslim and becoming more and more interested in those political issues. Um, I, as a, I, from Bangladesh, I, I consider myself as a Bengali because Bengali is it itself is an identity because we have this whole set of, uh, you know, you have literature, music, you have, you know, it's not a belief system, but it's a social and cultural identity. And Muslimness in our country was really very, um, it's just a philosophical what happens after life. And there was some aspect of it, like, you know, you get married in a Muslim way, but it was not even completely Muslim, like if, if you, you saw in Pakistan, there is this um, concept of Mehdi. In our country, it's called Gai Hulud, which is not really a Muslim thing, uh, but it's still there. And it's like a blend between uh, kind of local culture and then the Muslim type culture. But, but what I see here in, in England, England, I'm based in the UK, and I'm sure you see it in, in America as well, is that those cultural and other identities are kind of dissipating and it becomes more and more Muslim. Now, the problem becomes even more difficult for me to understand is, um, for example, me as an atheist, and I have seen a lot of ex-Muslims in this uh, part of the world, and they are actually fish out of the water because they don't have any other reference point. And I can see that you're trying to create a reference point. Um, the reason for I'm saying all these things is because the questions uh, that people usually raise when they read the title of your book, uh, they must ask you this question that, if you are asking people to actually leave the uh, identity or, or or actually evolve the identity, how they are going to actually work together and um, uh, and and Muslim identity is not something that we um, you know I have actually um, uh, for lack of a better word um, you know seen that you can be you can be leaving the Islam but still become a Muslim or remain a Muslim. How is that possible? And what part of Muslimness that you would like to keep and then what part of it you you think we should be I know uh, I, I'm asking maybe to divulge too much information about the book then people might lose interest buying the book but still I mean I'm, I'm curious that's over to yeah you. it's a I mean it's a the thing is it's not as uh, granular as that like so first of all I want to acknowledge that and I mentioned this in the book too that I think that it's uh, you're absolutely right about uh, the way that uh, uh, people have their cultural identities and how that sort of amalgamates with uh, the religious aspect. Uh, for instance, uh, Pakistani Muslims have more in common with Indian Hindus than they do with Saudi Muslims, right? And uh, uh, Turkish Muslims or Indonesian Muslims are completely different from Egyptian Muslims. And, you know, uh, Syrian uh, Muslims and Syrian Christians have more in common than they do, than Syrian Muslims do with Turkish Muslims. So th there's a very, there's definitely a cultural element. And then, uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of um, sort of uh, the uh, religious, the, the parts of it that come from religion are 
almost universal. Like, for instance, the, just the idea that uh, there should be, you know, there's life after death or there, you know, Ramadan, you fast. And then after that, you have families get together for the fast breaking ceremony. In Shia Islam, where I grew up, uh, the Muharram mourning period, that's common across all um, uh, Shia communities, whether they're Arab or Iranian or, or South Asian. And uh, uh, all of them sort of celebrate or mourn, I should say, uh, in in very similar ways, except in different languages and so on. So so there are um, some common elements, and it's sort of an amalgamation and it gets incorporated into it. Uh, so I, I do think that there is a common sort of uh, element, but you're right, like when people do come to Western countries, there's somehow this version of uh, this Arabized Islam and uh, that the people try to connect with it. And I think that plays more into the part of identity. These are people who are not even that religious. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about people who've actually left Islam that we know of, who are declared ex-Muslims like yourself or like me, um, that's very different from, there, there are millions of people who are not very religious. They're not very into the whole Islam thing, but they'll, and this is like, for instance, many people in my family, uh, but they will partake in Eid and they will partake in, you know, the Muharram thing. And then they won't, they don't like me saying, you know, that I can't tell you how many times people come up to me like, look, listen, I don't believe in this stuff either. You know, I know I've read it. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, you know, this is our tradition. It's our culture. So please don't criticize it. And I'm talking about like uncles and aunts and, you know, family, friends. So those are... Um, that, I think, is a really interesting phenomenon. Like, there are already a lot of people who are going to mosques, who are taking part in these celebrations, who are over there, who are seeing what ISIS does, and then they sit at home, and, you know, they have their whiskey, and they're like, okay, yeah, you know, I don't really believe in that, 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 all that stuff. That's just fairy tale. Because um, back, in, back in when I was, uh, as a teenage back in Bangladesh, I obviously uh, wasn't, I've never actually been a kind of a pious Muslim. I thought these are all guidelines and everything, but... Uh, on a Jumma, like a Friday prayer, my father used to say, um, it's a social thing, go and at least, you know, join the congregation. Uh, I, I did it for a few years and then I thought, this is bullshit, I'm not going to go for it. But, uh, you know, he still says those things to me, like, this is a social thing, even if you're an openly atheist, just, you know, think of it as a social thing. But unfortunately, I can see that um, the Ohabism that is kind of taking over the world, the Muslim because it's a generation thing, right? For example, my parents, when they grew up, they were um, subject to this, uh, you know, teaching of the Sunni, sorry, Sufi Islam, where it was more, less political and more kind of peaceful. But for example, after my generation, all the young people I see, they get only the content that comes out of Salafism or Wahhabism that becomes more and more radical every generation. So, mm -hmm. and the identity gets more and more ingrained into their, their life. So, and the identity itself has its kind of core base uh, coding that says, if anybody says he's an atheist, you are not supposed to even, you know, talk to them or, or all different degrees of, of ostracization happens in, in that area. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you realize, uh, if, if you saw this new documentary by uh, Dia Khan, um, is, who's a Norwegian. Oh, I did. It was excellent. You obviously saw. And, um, and on, on that one, the... There was this Muslim guy, like a preacher, he said, with this very smug face, he says, um, atheists um, can't expect the society to treat them the same way when they say they have left Islam. So um, mm -hmm. when these kind of guys, uh, you know, lead a community that thinks that way, that the moment you say you are not a full Muslim by definition, the society is going to ostracize you and actually try to make your life more and more difficult. How do you think we should deal with those sort of situations? Well, I think that's one of the insights that I went into this book. And I, I guess, you know, read it, you'll see, I've discussed that quite a bit, is that it's, uh, it's precisely because of that kind of situation that uh, a lot of people who are actually, by all definitions of the word, uh, they're atheists in a sense, they try to keep just one foot in, um, and this is a—it's a fascinating thing because, like, I—I uh, I go into like you know, I have cousins and I have family and uncles and aunts, and 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 sometimes I will, you know, I'll go to their dinners. I still partake in everything. Like, I I will go to uh, Eid parties and I do go to Ramadan iftars, and I mean, I don't necessarily fast, but uh, I will go there for the food. You know, that's you know, these love handles aren't going to build themselves. 
So uh, <laughs> I and whenever I go there, there's always I, I found that, you know, when they look at the whole atheist Muslim thing and they find the word Muslims, that they're much more receptive in a way to the term atheist. And I thought that was uh, actually quite funny because I, I think it's a it's a contradiction. I wrote an article in 2013 that first used the term atheist Muslim. At that point, I, you know, I wrote it kind of it was a bit of a tongue in cheek. Thing. And, I, and then I was amazed that a lot of people wrote they're like, yeah, you know, I think I'm an atheist Muslim, too. And, and then I'm seeing them. Then I realized I was like, you know, what we do as atheists, is we kind of try to appeal to this rational aspect of people. And uh, people are not inherently rational. There's an irrational aspect to it, too. There's an there's a there's an emotional aspect to it. There are many people who quietly think that, like, OK, you know, this stuff. I don't really like Jama. I don't really believe in this stuff. I'm really more interested and in, I've watched these Carl Sagan videos and I think that that stuff is really cool. But, you know, I really love my parents. They've done a lot for me. We get along. We have a lot of fun um, right, together. And, you know, I, I don't want to let that go completely. So I, so I, then, you know, you have this whole term. I, I, I think I now I see yeah. that because um, the Muslims themselves, yeah. um, obviously, for a lack of proper, I would say, guidance, the the mullahs come over and then dictate our philosophical life and then replace our cultural life with you know lack of culture that comes from saudi arabia that's how i describe it islam is lack of yeah. culture in my view culture by definition for example music artist artistry and you know um, literature and everything that actually makes a human being feel more human i mean that's the reason when we come from bengali culture we have so rich heritage of you know, music, Rabindra Shangit and all these different types of music we have. Yeah. And then we have proper literature that goes all the way back like for 500 years. And we, we, it's it's a rich collection. And the, what the mullahs comes in and they say, you, you actually have to, you know, leave those because apparently a lot of Bengali po uh, literary, you know, uh, cultural icons were from Hindu religion. And then Hindu and Muslims also wear Bengalis, and they say these are all Hindu elements. And because we hate Hindus, we have to get rid of all these elements and then become pure Muslim, which is like black and white. There is nothing else in there. There is no color. There is no love. There, it's really, really bad. And that makes me really angry with, at these mullahs that come out of Salafi thoughts. They are non-inclusive, very, very bad. So, yeah, yeah. What else? I mean, it's very tribal. It's extremely tribal. Yeah. What I was trying to come across is obviously this is great uh, that you're trying to do and the, the people, general people, obviously, as long as there is a word of their identity kind of hanging around, they can kind of transition. And I, I appreciate what you're we're trying yes, to do. And exactly. I, I hope, you know, it, it catches on. And um, this is one of the our discussion is to actually spread the, the love and, and make sure I'm sure my a lot of our viewers will go in and, and buy this book and have a have a read through and then try to actually uh, give the book as a Christmas gift to people to to read. You know, <laughs> you don't really have to be a, a, a Christian or, or a you know non-Muslim to actually give a book um, as, well, as a Christmas see, gift. Th that's that's what I'm saying. Like Christmas is a Christian holiday. So it's like one of those things that has a Christian has Christian roots in it. But I know a lot of Muslims who, uh, especially in the West, you know, we, we get our Christmas. Uh, if you're talking about Christmas. roots. Uh, Christmas is, comes actually from Solstice. pagan. Yeah, yeah, so, it does. It does. But what I, what I mean is like for all the, the the word Christmas and the way that it's celebrated, there's this whole idea of nativity scenes and and you have uh, a lot of... I understand yeah. that there's a, there's a history to it. Yeah, they, of course they did. But, you know, there's... And by that token, you know, I always say that, uh, you know, when people talk about Islam and, you know, I'd, I'd, you get... I'm sure you get this a lot that you're paid by the Jews and, you know, a Zionist agent and this and that. So I always tell them, I'm like, yeah. you know, if you're talking about a Jew, the check that Islam I've never is... received from Saudi uh, uh, Israel. I, I, I'm, by the, <laughs> yeah. the work I've done so far, I should have been billionaire by now. I, 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 we all should be rich, but you know those the the evil Zionists they just won't pay us. But you know the the thing I always tell them I'm like you know the actual Islam itself is the biggest Jewish conspiracy because you know if uh, Moses hasn't hadn't really come up with the whole Judaism he hadn't hallucinated the Judy the Jewish religion then uh, the Muhammad wouldn't have been able to plagiarize it because in a sense that you know that a lot of Islam is actually derived from from Judaism it's and I, I go about I talk about this in the book as well you have salam and shalom you have this sort of aversion to foreskins and you know nobody wants a foreskin anywhere near them uh, you have the no not no eating of pork you have a lot of the sort of 
uh, the the penal codes and uh, the punishments uh, that they have. So it's uh, it's it's really interesting to me. Like you know, when people actually read the two, they're very very similar. And, and we know that Muhammad, when he was sent by Khadija to go to his wife, his first wife uh, Khadija, he was sent to Damascus to trade with the merchants. A lot of the merchants there uh, were also Jewish, and, and he did take a liking to monotheism at the time as well. Uh, so there's also historical evidence that you know that could have happened where it was derived from it. So even all of these things, you know, you know, when we talk about the hijacking of Christmas as a you know the pagan ritual and so on, um, those aspects are there. But the the interesting thing is we have been able somehow to successfully secularize Christmas. You know, I know Jewish people, I know Muslims, everybody had a Christmas tree, everybody likes giving the idea of, you know, Santa Claus to their kids. Um, there's, they celebrate it, and uh, yet, you know, it's, it's been completely secularized. And, and you'll see that a lot of uh, sort of uh, traditional Christians, the evangelical Christians, uh, did you see that video that uh, went viral online recently of a pastor went into a mall and there were all these kids in line waiting to sit on Santa's lap. And he went and started yelling at the kids. He's like, you know, Santa isn't real. Jesus is the truth. Your parents are lying to you and all of this. I'll, I'll send I it heard of it, but I didn't see it yet. But he's, he's a fun, fundamentalist Christian, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was. He was a fundamental Christian. And he was very upset at the idea that uh, he thought that Christmas had been hijacked by Santa Claus. Who was a, and all the parents were coming up. They're like, why are you telling us? This was in Texas, I think. And. You know, they didn't want him to obviously tell their kids that Santa isn't real. They wanted to keep up the magic. But it was amazing because he was saying, you know, the truth is really that Christmas is about Jesus. It's not about Santa. So so there is that element of frustration. And well, we can I know draw that, a uh, parallel from this with the, with the mullahs, right? Uh, in Beng mm -hmm. Bangladesh, at least, there is this culture of uh, milad. I don't know in Pakistan if they had this. Like um, after mm -hmm. prayers, people are going to congregate and they'll do this. Um, they'll do this like a recitation of certain things, uh, you know, led by a mullah. And then after this, there's going to be a munajat. And then after that, there's going to be some sweets distributed. It was like a completely social thing. When the Salafis came around, they yeah. said, this is haram. We're not supposed to do these things. Come on. I mean, you're killing the mood here. So I think this is a Christian version <laughs> of the same thing. Like killing but, culture. Uh, you know what's amazing? Of, like, yeah. Yeah, there's a um, uh, there's a, a tradition in like you know the Shia uh, mourning ritual in Muharram when we have the majalis and uh, you know mourn the death of uh, Hussein, who was a grandson of Muhammad, who got killed in Karbala. So they do that. People weep and then they do the self-flagellation thing where they beat their chests and they sing these actually the really beautiful tunes. They're called nahas, mm -hmm. um, which I I still mm -hmm. sing. I actually it's it's really funny, but I just because of the musicality of it, I still enjoy them. Um, but uh, what happens is they just sort of weep and they mourn for about 15, 20 minutes. And then after that, it's, you know, Kashmiri tea and samosas and everybody gets <laughs> together. And, you know, people, the, you know, the boys check out the girls and, you know, things like that. And vice versa. I'm pretty sure the girls check out the boys, too. And no, it, it's, it becomes sort of a, it's a social event. So I uh, and I write in the book, I'm like my um, some of my happiest memories, like family and childhood memories um, are from the morning season which is really strange. It's a morning season, you're not supposed to be happy. But um, so, so there are cultural elements of that that I think it's tough for uh, people to, uh, people don't want to lose it because it's, it's, they grew up with it. Religion is such, a, Islam is such a big part of uh, all of these cultures in that sense, like the, the Muharram celebration, the Eid, and you know, all the examples that we've been talking about, that uh, you know, it becomes part of their childhood memories, part of their heritage, their, their, you know, what they remember with their families. And, and I also want to say, uh, by the way, there are a lot of families, and I've talked to a lot of uh, young uh, ex-Muslims who didn't have those pleasant experiences. They were forced to fast, and they were actually, uh, you know, uh, d these same elements were used to oppress them, both cultural and religious. Uh, but um, I, I just have noticed that I, I think that, you know, when you do acknowledge that aspect of the experience, uh, which I, I would call the Muslim experience, um, then it's a lot easier for people when they know that, okay, I, I like, you know, I, I celebrated, you know, Eid just like you, you know, I enjoy the Ramadan feast just like you. I enjoy all of that stuff. My family's Muslim. We, we still communicate in the same way, all of that. Yeah, um, I wish I could say so I'm same. not attacking. Right. Wish I could say the same that happens to uh, atheists in Bangladesh. I mean, the moment you say you're an atheist, it's no, like that, you're, you're completely right. done and gone. And I think the similar thing happens in the, in yeah, the UK no, no, that, as well. That's, 
Yeah, no, that, that's one of the, the points that I was trying to get at, uh, just to complete the thought is uh, when I when I tell people that I'm like, you know, I have had these experiences and I grew up with them and I did appreciate them. Um, and uh, what's happened now is that when I when I do that, then when I criticize Islam, they don't take it as an attack on their identity because they're like this guy. OK, he knows my experience. So he's not attacking me or my family or my heritage or you know, what my identity is. He's just talking about the ideas. He's criticizing the ideas. And that becomes a very different thing. But uh, as I said before, you're absolutely right that, you know, when it comes to atheists in Bangladesh and a lot of the ex-Muslims out there, I mean, they don't have uh, the same experience. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting discussion. And, uh, you know, I have kind of talked about that uh, there as well. And uh, it is because of actually the experiences that uh, people like Avijit, um, uh, you know, and people like yourself and many other people like the, the Bangladesh bloggers, uh, for instance, who've been, you know, just brutally hacked to death on the street. Uh, when people see that, I mean, that's one of the reasons uh, that many of them are, this is how terrorism works. I and mean, that's one of the reasons many people who are even thinking of changing their mind, they don't want to do it. And I feel that if we do acknowledge their experiences, uh, they will find some sort of avenue where they can do it. And, and there are different things. I mean, for me, it's about options. At one point when I was growing up, we had, you know, you were religious or you were just the infidel. You were either Muslim or you were kafir, and that's it. And now you have, you know, Majid Nawaz and Rahil Raza talking about reform, uh, you know, about reinterpretation of things, which I, I may not agree with ideologically, but, you know, I, in terms of purpose, uh, I'm aligned with, uh, you'll have, uh, what what I'm doing here, with, you know, the the identity aspect, and you know, somehow acknowledging that while you also criticize Islam and you embrace atheism, um, and then you have people who completely everything. So, can I now take the discussion slightly towards to the darker side? Um, I have this. Um, Let's do that. <laughs> I know it's not something that uh, we would want to do, but the reason I want I, this question is itching in my head as well. Um, is I'm talking about um, the the creation of these identities at the beginning. I mean, um, I think um, you can correct me if I'm wrong and if I'm you know talking from my ear side. But um, the creation of identities, what I mean is um, you know Huntington's theory of of clash of civilizations and um, the creation of this civilization, or actually accentuating the civilizations to a certain extent that they they collide to each other and then somebody benefiting from this whole thing and if i could explain the the symptoms that i see throughout the globe these days for example in america you have trump one of his um uh, interest it was to actually use the muslims as an enemy the same thing happened in in brexit and i can see that same thing is also happening other places in in europe and also in india and, and are definitely sometimes some places in china and russia as well so creating this Muslim identity that is then weaponized or should I say radicalized and then within those countries showing those Muslims as some sort of a uh, you know enemy of the state or you know social enemy and then using them to radicalize the other side and bringing them to power this political conspiracy you can say but the symptoms are so similar um, how do you think we should explain that and how uh, your uh, efforts and you know like efforts of Majid Nawaz can actually try to diffuse that and take the take the direction to it to a to a, to a better level uh, I, I mean I hope you understood what I tried to say yeah I, I think I do I, I and I this kind of does go back to another aspect of the title of the book and that's a separation of ideas from people so you know one thing I say in the book is human beings have rights and are entitled to respect ideas, books, and beliefs don't and aren't. So it is very, very important to criticize Islam as a doctrine and a religion. But it's also very important to uphold the rights of people, including Muslims, to believe what they want. And and that's the thing. Uh, you don't uh, combat ideas by banning people or building walls. Because, I mean, especially now we see, you know, people are being recruited through the internet. You can't build a wall to, you know, to, uh, ban the internet unless you're North Korea. And that's not who we are, right? So I think uh, uh, that distinction of being able to criticize ideas without demonizing all of the people who hold them is very important. And it's not a, and, and one thing I kind of um, 
that was interesting to me, and I write about this in the book. It's if I could interject mm -hmm. there for a quick second, um, the demonization aspect yeah. that you said, um, I think no discussion is going to be complete without mentioning our friendly foes, the regressive lefts, who seem to be taking really yeah. good interest in creating that demonization effect. Although uh, a, us atheists or you know, non-regressives are trying to actually criticize the idea itself, they seem to be interested in kind of diverting the discussions towards hurting the people only. They're not interested in the religious, uh, you know, ideology or or they somehow reinforce and buy into this concept of that ideology and people, you can't separate them together. So I thought I just mm -hmm. mentioned, I mean, how do we deal with those as well? Um, it could be a digress. So but no, no, no. This is actually, this falls right into line. This is what I was going to say next. So you have, uh, th this is a problem with both, not just a regressive left, but also with the right. Uh, so, and and th this is the importance of separating ideas from beliefs. So on the regressive left, what they do is they say any criticism of Islam, any criticism of the idea is bigotry against all Muslims. So you can't criticize Islam because if you criticize Islam, you're a bigot against all Muslims. So what are they doing? They're mixing up idea and people. They're mixing up criticizing idea with demonizing people. On the right, they say Islam has a lot of problems, which means all Muslims must be screened, they must be banned from the country, we must crack down on immigration and all that. So what they're doing is they're also conflating uh, the idea with the people. So th this is the mistake that both of them are making. So again, you know, on the left, criticizing the idea means that uh, you are a bigot against all people. On the right, they're saying there are problems with the idea, so all the people must be bad. Um, and both sides are making this mistake. So this is why it's even more important. Now, in the, in the book, uh, what I talk about is I talk about this in terms of uh, Muslim majority countries and uh, countries where uh, Muslims are a minority. And what's interesting is in countries where Muslims are a minority, Islam is an identity. And in countries where Muslims are a majority, Islam is actually a religion. So the effects of that are really interesting because... Um, you know, you have somebody who talks, you have a woman, for instance, who in, in the West, in the UK or in Canada or the US, chooses to wear the hijab, right? She chooses to wear it as a symbol of her identity because she's Muslim. Um, and all of the liberals will defend her right because she is, you know, it's part of the liberal conscience to protect the rights of minorities and Muslims are one of those minorities. So you have that. But the same hijab that over here she's wearing as a symbol of identity um, and that all of the liberal left is uh, sort of cheering her for, that same hijab is used in Muslim-majority countries by their governments, their husbands, their fathers, to oppress these women. To, they're forced onto them, and they're actually doing these, uh, you know, they're, they're rebelling against this over there. So you have the liberal in a Muslim-majority country who's rebelling against the exact same thing that the liberal in a Muslim minority country, in a, uh, in a country where Muslims are a minority, is wearing as a symbol of uh, identity and pride. And this is, a, this is a very confusing thing. And this is something that people don't understand because what the regressive left does then, even though they may be well-intentioned, is they're actually celebrating illiberal ideas, right? They're celebrating illiberal ideas that their own fellow liberals in Muslim majority countries are fighting against because they're oppressed by them. Right. And so and, and I tell people this, I'm like, do you know, you know, Raif Badawi, the blogger in, in, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia who's jailed and he's a hero of the left and the right here. He's, you know, he's fighting for free speech. But I, what's fascinating is if you read his writings about, you know, liberalism and Islam, if he came here and he lived in the U.S., people would call him an Islamophobe because of the same things he's saying. So I, and the only difference is that he's a liberal in a Muslim majority country, whereas we over here are, uh, you know, the Muslim community here is more, more of an identity. So that's another uh, aspect of it that's really interesting is that, you know, Islam in, in one place is an identity and the other place is actually taken as an ideology and it's implemented as such and you can see the dangers of it. So it's a difficult problem to get around, but... I think that uh, the way to get around it is to drive home this message. And it's not a contradictory message, the idea that, you know, you can criticize the idea, but you shouldn't demonize the people. I mean, this is something that uh, Evelyn Beatrice Hall, and this is, they say Voltaire said this, but it was actually Evelyn Beatrice Hall that said it, is that I will defend to the death. I, I, sorry, I, I may despise what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. So 
Um, and I, me... I think that. Sorry, I was gonna mm. say that brings to Go me ahead. to us uh, to another conundrum: is that how and why? Um, uh, because you and I obviously we are trying uh, to to convey the message, and uh, we are reaching a certain number of people. But when it comes to general media that has the biggest kind of spread, um, they somehow don't pay attention, or they seem to be quite preoccupied or interested in a in a different aspect. Like for example, the likes of the regressive left that we call them, they seem to get floor. Uh, you know, uh, airtime and all these things, um, although they are actually conveying the wrong message. But when we try to actually mend the situation, we don't get that much of exposure. Do you see any conspiracy or any kind of um, prejudice uh, here? Um, I, I don't think there is a conspiracy. I think a lot of it is just uh, sort of uh, ignorance. There is a lot of uh, guilt as well on the part of the regressive left. Um, in that uh, they, uh, again, I, as I said before, like the, the part of the liberal conscience is to protect minorities and their rights. And, and what's really fascinating to me is that uh, when you do do that, um, you end up, a lot of these minorities do tend to have very conservative values. Uh, so what's, you know, say like the Latino minority or the African-American minority or the Muslim minorities, you know, when you, when you actually uh, uh, look at these groups, they all are embraced by the liberal side in general, right? But uh, attitudes towards, let's say, homosexuals, like homophobia, is much more rampant. Like they have much more conservative um, attitudes towards homosexuals in these minority communities uh, than you would think otherwise. Uh, Muslims are generally a very, a lot of their uh, values on uh, things like same-sex marriage or abortion, they would align a lot more with the Republicans. However, uh, they vote Democrat because you know there's that idea of that the you know we must protect the rights of minorities. So it is a it is a bit of a mess. It's very complicated. Um, it's complicated because I, the the words that you used uh, just one word, which is the word vote, and that causes the most problem in my view because um, the mm -hmm. in, at least in England you you know about this term called multiculturalism that plagued England for the last thirty yeah. years or so, and that created this silo effect oh, yeah. uh, where well, yeah, they they um, the authorities were more interested in talking only to certain leaders who happened to have criminal background, and their interest was to actually work with the Saudi Arabia and create and, and kind of separate the the Muslim population per se from different cultural backgrounds, put them in one pot, and give them an identity called Muslims, and then nurturing that Muslims. Uh, and then radicalizing some of them so that some of them could go actually to Syria and join ISIS. And they're still not trying to mend it. They're, they're still doing it the, completely the wrong way. Um, I can see, for example, in here that Theresa May is trying to create more and more religious uh, schools rather than introducing secular uh, education and kind of generalizing it. The, nobody seems to be interested in that. There's the, the community leaders, so-called, are still in power. And and, and, the, uh, and the introduction and kind of empowerment of the Sharia councils, as you know, Mariam Namazi and and uh, Pragna and, and mm -hmm. you know, the one law for all they're trying to, but they are not getting any kind of floor because government seems to be still interested in giving these communities uh, what they want, which is actually the Salafi interest. So I don't know how we are going mm -hmm. to get out of this conundrum. What do you think? Is there any hope for us in the future? Um, I think I, I actually think uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic, cautiously. Ca I'm, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic about this uh, than um, uh, most other people, and that's just because uh, I've been very close to this uh, idea that since I started writing again in around 2007, 2008, I, I've corresponded with uh, so many uh, sort of undercover, you know, underground uh, ex-Muslims in the Muslim world, including a, a large number in Bangladesh. And again, like I, I don't know whether what the real numbers are from polling and so on, um, even though there have been some polls that are done, but we can get to that later. Uh, but I, I find it, I find that things are very different now than they were in the Salman Rushdie days, where he had to actually go into hiding. Uh, he walks around uh, relatively freely now. I mean, compared to what he did before, um, I know that there are much more, there are many more voices that are speaking out. I mean, we're having this this podcast. We did this in the late '80s. I mean, this is something that would have much, much more dire consequences. I think that uh, the this this dialogue 
um, is more multifaceted. So, you know, at one point, I, like I said, when, when I was younger, we had the choice that, you know, you were either Muslim or you were a Kafir, you were an infidel. Um, now you have these different avenues, like, you know, Quilliam and what Majid Nawaz is doing. Um, that's really interesting. I think that's a, that's a good sign. Uh, I think that what, uh, you know, what, what I'm doing, you know, that is resonating with people. I think what, what you are doing and you and Avijit and all the other sort of Bangladeshi bloggers who I think are heroes, actually, um, is uh, what, what they're doing is having an impact that's making headlines. What Raif Badawi is doing is, is making headlines, too. So it's, it's, it's not an overnight process. It's not going to happen immediately. Uh, but I think we're finding um, avenues. And you know, one example I give is this. Uh, there's different approaches work on different people. And uh, an example I give is, you know, one of the civil rights movement where you had someone like Rosa Parks who just sat in the front of the bus and she wouldn't move back. So she acted in silence, had a huge impact. Then you had uh, someone like uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, and he was more of a diplomat. He was a little bit more political and he was conciliatory and he was a negotiator. Uh, and that had a, that resonated with a, a whole different group of people. And then you had Malcolm X who was completely militant you know, and that also resonated with a group of people. And all of that, all of those things had a place. All of those approaches had, an, had a place. And I think the most important thing now is uh, that we have many different approaches. You know, we have, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, you have the aspect of science and critical thinking and, you know, giving people the process. You have the aspect of reinterpreting scripture the way that Majid and, and Rahil Raza are doing. Uh, you have the ex-Muslim uh, aspect where people are talking about leaving us and there are more and more people uh, going into that fold and what the, the work that Mariam Namazi, uh, people like Mariam Namazi is doing um, or the people, the work that people like Avijit Troy and you uh, were doing I, I as well. So there's to, a... Uh, I actually have to uh, apologize because um, uh, my my depression or, or should I say uh, pessimism is, is to do with my personal experience with what has been happening in Bangladesh. Um, uh, for the last two or three years, you saw a lot of people, a lot of colleagues of mine got killed. And unfortunately, that didn't change a thing in Bangladesh. And it's actually gone the other way. The Islamists are getting more and more powerful. And there are laws now being passed even more stricter against uh, blasphemy. And, and and this makes me, you know, worried about Bangladesh. But in the greater sense, in, in, the, in the global world, I think, uh, as you said, uh, <laughs> there is actually a chance of hope. It's just uh, we have to keep at it we can't actually leave or, mm. or you know despair uh, we have to keep at it at some point if we keep pushing there's going to be a, a change that i mean i'm sure if um, malcolm x or uh, any of the civil rights movement people felt bad about the current situation they would not actually achieve anything if you, if you look at the future and feel hopeful and push hard then possibly um we will, I, I, we will be think... able to change it yeah, that, that's actually, that's exactly what I'm getting at. I mean, these are not things that happen overnight. I mean, if you, even if you, I, I sometimes give, well, first of all, I just want to address the, uh, the idea of, uh, like, when, the day that we found out that Avijit Roy was killed. So, Avijit and I had corresponded before, um, and I'd started talking to him, actually, um, the, sometime before uh, his death. And uh, he had uh, he had he had the Muktamono blog, right? Um, and uh, he actually translated an article of mine called "An Open Letter to Moderate Muslims," and uh, we started talking after that. So, uh, you know, I, I thought he was a great guy. I thought he was brilliant. I thought the stuff he wrote was uh, excellent. And it's when he when he died, the Mother bloggers community, yes, it's absolutely absolutely. I mean, it was a, and all of them. I mean, everything that's happened since. And uh, at that point, I talked to my friend. Um, Faisal Sayyid al Matar, and I was in the middle of writing this book at the time. Another and I great guy. I, said, I, have I, really to, do I have to say, I personally am indebted yeah. to Faisal Sayyid al Matar. If you're watching Faisal, you know, keep keep doing what you're doing. You are you're a great inspiration to all of us. Yeah, yeah, he's he's fantastic, and I, I remember talking to him, and I said that you know, should we really do this? Because like this is scary. I mean, th this is someone we knew. I mean, he he was American. He lived in Atlanta. He went there, and just the, the way that uh, he was killed. I mean, it was. It, it scares you. And uh, when we talked about it, we eventually came to the conclusion that, well, this should make us double down more. Because how do you become a victim of terrorism is that, you know, if you stop what you're doing, if you stop talking about it, that's when it happens. And when, we, when you have, when it's so close to home, when you have personal friends, like Raif Badawi is a personal friend of mine. You know, Avijit Roy is somebody who I, who I knew and I, I talked to frequently. It, you know, so when... When these things happen to people that we know, it makes you 
you know, there's a part of you that does get scared, but then there's another part of you that later emerges that makes you even more determined um, to do what you're doing. And, you know, what you're saying from the start, look, if I was, if I knew all these people and you, I know that you were, um, you know, sort of one of the pioneers of this whole secularist movement in, in Bangladesh and with all of the Bengali bloggers. So, you know, you deserve tremendous credit for that. Um, but uh, what you're seeing from the surface, and you know, and I, I know what you're saying. You know, when this happened, when these uh, bloggers get murdered, uh, the well, the prime minister comes out. One thing I could understand, well, like, the, the Islamists may become criminal and they can take things into their hands and you know do their religious duty by killing us. My worry was, mm -hmm. my my anger was that the secular, so-called secular government, not only you know took took a blind eye out, but also was actually pursuing us, the bloggers instead of actually pursuing the Islamists. Yeah. And that made us that, that's completely exactly, lose our mind. I know, that's a, that, and that's exactly what I was going to get to. The prime minister came out and she's like, well, they shouldn't have written what they wrote anyway, which is absolutely, it's infuriating. But uh, it just saying, I mean, we, the, we talked about this a little earlier, is that, you know, you, you're talking about on the surface, you know, you're seeing all these protests coming out and people talking about hanging the bloggers and so on in Bangladesh. And it seems like the situation is getting worse. But how many people have you seen who have written to you in private and who've talked to you in private and, and who've out of it? Plenty I comments. mean, if I showed you my inbox, well, that, that's what I'm saying. I think the more that this stuff happens, I, the, the only difference between those public protests by the Islamists and the, the, what, what we see in our email inboxes you know, people like you, me, I know Fessel does too. Um, I know uh, Sam Harris has talked about it as well. Is uh, The only difference is that these emails are, they're private. Like people can't speak up about it. Um, and, and you're not going to see them protesting in the streets. Uh, but the numbers are huge. I mean, th there was a Win Gallup poll that was done, um, I think a couple of years ago, uh, that actually uh, polled people in a lot of Muslim majority countries, including Saudi Arabia. And in Saudi Arabia, 19% of the respondents said that. And, and again, this is Gallup. This isn't just a, a regular sort of uh, quack polling agency. They do their agency. stuff properly. Yeah, they do their stuff properly. And, and they found out that 19% of Saudis, when they replied to the poll, uh, they said that they're not religious. 19%. That is more than Italy. In Italy, that number was 15%. Then when they asked them how many of them were confirmed atheists, and those are the literal words, confirmed atheists, 5% of Saudis replied that they were confirmed atheists. Um, that number is the same as it is in the United States, 5%. And 5% of Saudis saying that, that's millions of people. So we're talking about millions of people in Saudi Arabia who actually say that they're confirmed atheists. And um, I, th I think that's a big deal. That's not something I, th I think that uh, I really saw some time ago. The only difference is you're not going to see it on the news. So if you look at it on the news, you're going to see all the Islamic protests. I mean, one thing in Pakistan, and I got a lot of uh, uh, people from can Pakistan I, too. Can but I say something Umtaz interesting yeah. here? Um, I know yeah. uh, generally we think America is great and everything, and uh, probably you have the same, and I used to think the same. But recently, uh, when I was doing some research about um, the age a, a girl are allowed to get married under special circumstances as if... Um, if she gets pregnant by yeah. somebody, um, and I was looking at this um, like a um, like a graph thing somebody created, and I could see a, a graph, a graphics illustration of the whole world geographical map, and then everything else was green, but the two countries that stick out in red are Saudi Arabia and America, are the two countries where girls as young as 13 are allowed to get married in special circumstances. And that's where I think the similarities start between those two countries, although America has this upper hand thinking that they're really great and everything. But in those cases, which we don't really care about generally, but we should, Saudi Arabia is not really that far off, you know, and, and America is not yeah. that high. Yeah. Yeah, so I yeah I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit there. I understand that I think that there are a lot of really really strange, uh, sort of almost theocratic um, laws in the U.S. Like you know they, you know no alcohol on Sundays and you know the it, it, just it's some some of the things I mean, there's a, still a lot of religion in the um, government, especially at the state level. So this age of girls getting married is actually varies from state to state, and it really depends on um, uh, where you're looking at it, but. I, I think that uh, I still think that having grown up in Saudi Arabia and then having also lived in the U.S. for many many years, um, I 
I think it's safe to acknowledge that there are some things in the U.S. are still very regressive and illiberal, uh, but I don't. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily equivalent or they can oh, no, be no. compared. That's what, that's I, what I, I still think saying. that Sorry. the Constitution I mean, of the U.S., me, the laws me, of the U.S. Let I, me take a free quick yeah, second to just to explain yeah. the, the uh, illustration I was just pointing out. But I know, for example, in Saudi Arabia, a young girl could get raped or abused by somebody much older than her and still has to get married. In America, on the other hand, young girls experiment with their peers within the same high school or something. So there, whoever she gets pregnant by is actually could be the same age uh, classmate or schoolmate. This is completely different. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to what try to say is as in some aspects, as you said, but I didn't draw a parallel between the two countries. It's just... Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That, that's fine. That's fine. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't think. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, you wouldn't do that anyway. The uh, the thing is, uh, I, I think it comes down to choice, right? I, the, in the U.S., they do have a concept, a concept of emancipated minors. And this is some, like, you know, for, for instance, um, like I, I knew about this case of uh, this young girl who was, I think, 15 or 16. And, uh, you know, her, her mother was in jail and her father was basically a, just a deadbeat. So she had kind of had to look out for herself. She'd done sort of like odd jobs and done, and she had people who were sympathizers and so on. So sometimes people like that in those situations, uh, minors in the, are given emancipated status. So they don't necessarily need parental consent for a lot of things people need parental consent for. They, they're able to sort of live their lives legally as adults to some extent. So they, they tend to also become exceptions in terms of, you know, if they want to get married or if they want to do other things, as far as I know. Um, I could be wrong about some of the some of the details there. Um, so I think there's that aspect, but it comes down to choice, right? I mean, there there is this uh, this idea of um, like I, when I was in Pakistan, people used to talk about arranged marriage, and they're like, well, you know, in the U.S., you know, people just meet at bars and then they lie to each other and they sleep with each other and they never talk to each other again. At least when a husband comes in to propose to a girl in an arranged marriage, he's doing it with the intention of marriage and you know staying with her the whole time. And I just told him, I'm like, that doesn't account for choice. If it's your choice is to see somebody overnight and that's it. Uh, and that's your thing. You know, that that's should be okay. And if it's your choice, it makes it too. That's somebody describing a very brutal act in a very uh, sugary way. That's it. It's not that, fun. That it's you not see nice. all the time. I know. I um, so, so some of these, uh, I, I, do, I do think that there are definitely problems and I, I, you know, I, I see what you're saying. There's a lot of people like now when I talk about if you criticize Trump, they'd be like, you know, if you criticize Trump for his uh, uh, his uh, the Muslim ban thing that he did, someone will always come up and say, well, Muhammad was worse. Or if you criticize Christianity or some of the strange ideas in Christianity, like, you know, the, the virgin birth or some of the miracles, Jesus walking on water and all of that, you know, sort of uh, nonsense. You'll say things like that, and uh, they'll be like, "Well, at least they're not killing people like the Muslims are," you know, even though they were hundreds of years ago. And every religion has its time. So, uh, th there are people who, when you when you get into this comparison thing, mm. then you it's a way to sort of make your thing immune from criticism as well. You know, that is a way to do it. If you compare sort of uh, Donald Trump to, um, you say, "Well, what about you know Baghdadi?" Whenever you say Baghdadi, I mean, so Baghdadi's a horrible, horrible man. It's much worse than Trump. But does that mean that we should, oh, now I should not criticize Trump anymore because, you know, but God, he's worse. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. That's, I think so that's called a people do, dissonance, isn't it? I mean, um, oh, yeah, in some it way. Is. It's, it's a fallacy. It's an argument fallacy. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, I, I don't think people really don't have many questions. Um, uh, someone said mm -hmm. that your book title is much more, much provocative as the, at the same time, ambivalent prejudice. How do you explain it? I don't even know what he's trying to say. Did you get it? I did, no, I didn't understand the question. Ambivalent so said, prejudice? Yeah, maybe. I don't know what he's talking about. He's saying the book title is much provocative. At the same time, ambivalent prejudice. Uh, I didn't get it. So maybe he will explain it in some few minutes. Um, so uh, Muhammad mm -hmm. Mia saying, what's generosity got to do with being religious? Christianity did not have stupid amount of practices and those that existed were fought against and people own their freedom from the law from them long ago these qu comments are quite uh, what is a yeah sorry what was the first part of that question 
So it's, it's, it's a comment, I think. Um, he says, what's generosity got to do with being religious? Uh, I think at some point we were talking about um, keeping the good stuff from religion. And then um, I think oh. he, he, he took a kind of a different, uh, you know, opinion about what we were saying. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we were talking specifically about generosity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that religion is especially generous. Uh, compared to uh, uh, oh, people sorry, who are non-religious at all. Actually, this guy was commenting on another guy who commented, Christian religion is more generous than any other religion. I, I missed that. So he was just saying, mm -hmm. what's generosity got to do with being religious? Yeah, got you now. Um, yeah, I, I, this this idea that Christianity, like a lot of things are sort of attributed to uh, Christianity. Like the, the reason that you have uh, secularism and all of these things today is not because of Christianity. It's in spite of Christianity. It's because they fought against Christianity. And the reason that the First Amendment of the U.S. says that, uh, you know, there's no, there'll be no establishment of a state religion is from, you know, years and years of experience that they had of being oppressed by state religion and the problems that uh, mixing politics and state had to do. So the, the reason that we do have uh, secularism, the reason that Christianity is sort of, I like to say, it's, it's a castrated, dismembered version of Christianity and uh, it was the Reformation and the Enlightenment that was able to do that to Judeo-Christian values. So it's not that the, the U.S. wasn't really founded on Judeo-Christian values. The U.S. was founded on diluting and dismembering those Judeo-Christian values and keeping the things that they thought were relatively innocuous and separating it from the politics of the state, which were completely secular. So it was actually a response to that. I'm going to interrupt because I got a question from Ali Nazar. And he said, uh, you were about to say something about Pakistan before me. I interrupted. I'm sorry about that, Ali, if you found it offensive. So how do you see this okay. issue Good. in the context of Pakistan? So do you have any comments on that? Uh, which issue in the context of Pakistan? Oh, I... I yeah, I remember what I was going to say. I was I was talking about in Pakistan recently. Uh, the um, uh, there was a governor, Salman Tasir, who was a governor of Punjab, which is the biggest uh, province in Pakistan, and uh, he was assassinated by his own bodyguard. And his bodyguard was essentially an Islamist. His name was Mumtaz Qadri, and uh, the reason that he was assassinated was that this governor. Um, stood up for the rights of a Christian woman who had been thrown in jail for blasphemy. So he was uh, opposing blasphemy laws. And because of that, Muntaz Qadri killed him. Now, Muntaz Qadri was celebrated after that. After he murdered him, he became a hero. I mean, he's a, he's a bigger hero. Let's put it this way. Malala Yousafzai, who was shot by Taliban, and she won the Nobel Prize, is reviled by a large part of the Pakistani public. But Mumtaz Qadri, if you actually Google um, his funeral after he was executed, if you Google his funeral, there are millions of people who attended in person his funeral. I mean, the crowds are absolutely, it's mind boggling how that happened. And that's a very prog problematic thing. And I think that uh, uh, Pakistan has regressed a lot and it's, it's become a really huge problem there, especially the, uh, I guess, you know, when you were talking about the Arabization and the, and the sort of, um, the, the creeping in of these uh, uh, Salafist values. Uh, so it's, it, it is a big problem. But on, on the upside, again, I hear from many, many people in Pakistan, and I'm talking about politicians and journalists and people who are actually well-renowned, <coughs> who've been encouraging the kind of work that, uh, that I'm doing that you're doing as well. So. That, um... I can say that Khalid Hamid also asked a similar question. He said, what is the future of atheism in Pakistan, uh, if you have comments on it? I don't know what the future is. I, I think that, you know, you, you know, one of the things that we talk about, and this is, you know, when we talk about the future in Pakistan, uh, we talk about the immigration issue in Europe, is we talk about sort of destinations. We're not talking about the processes. Right. And <clears throat> like, you know, they'll say they'll all be sur there'll be these surveys that, you know, Islam will be the biggest religion in the world in 2050. There will be more Muslims than ever. But, you know, the thing is, uh, my parents were Muslim. My family was Muslim, too. So were yours. And with the vast majority of ex-Muslims I know, I mean, pretty much all of them, uh, they came from Muslim families, too. And what we're talking about is the goal. 
is that you know they're all going to be Muslim. We're, we're not accounting for is the process. So instead of thinking about you know what are we going to do with immigration, how are we going to keep them out, how are we going to change this or convert this or do that, uh, we should really be talking about the process. For me, it's about teaching critical thinking tools, um, you know, teaching people about science, about rationality, creating a wonderment, the kind of amazement and uh, wonderment that people get from sort of religious miracles in a way. I got that from Carl Sagan. And I have a chapter in my book, chapter five, it's called Choosing Atheism, that actually talks about that in all of the emotional sort of connotation that I felt it. Uh, so uh, I, I think that those aspects, starting young, reforming the education system, um, really bringing interest to things like science and uh, studies of the universe and everything around you, um, and I think that process is very, very important to inculcate. And I, I think that's something that we can all work on. So I don't know if I should actually entertain this silly question, but somebody said, why do you have a beard like a mullah if you are an atheist? Why do I have a beard like a mullah if I'm an atheist? I don't know. That's, that's a, that convinced You don't really have to answer that. Now. No, no, I love the question. It's fantastic. It's, it's because I'm an undercover uh, Zionist agent and uh, I'm doing uh, taqiyya. Yeah. That's why. Undercover Zionist agent who's actually an ex, uh, that doesn't extremist Muslim pretending to be an atheist, right? Right, exactly. That's, that's what I am. All yeah. of the different conspiracy, identities. Identity. Conspiracy theories are so rampant. I mean, I love them sometimes. So, um, <laughs> I think um, we have uh, run the course of our time frame, and I know that you actually have to go, and um, I really appreciate your making the time today. And... Um, uh, and uh, you know it's a Sunday, and you obviously have to uh, take your child to 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 something. Um, but before before you go, um, uh, do you do you have like a message that we can, you you want to actually say for a few minutes and few lines, and then we can start wrapping it up. This question. Um, I I don't really I I think I wanted to actually say to you. Uh, to keep up the work that you're doing, I think is very, very important. It's brave. I know you're on a lot of hit lists. I know that uh, there uh, are legitimate concerns. You know, like you're actually living it for the security of you, yourself, and your family, and a lot of your colleagues. You've seen many of your own colleagues and friends and close associates uh, be brutally murdered in Bangladesh. So I, I just want to say that um, all of the work that you're doing, despite all of the risks, um, is amazing to me. I think it's heroic, and I think you should continue doing it. And, you know, I am here to support you in any way that you want. I, I really appreciate it because I have um, been following you for a long time now, and every time there is a, a problem with Bangladeshi, you know, the secularism and everything, you have stood up and you have actually helped us uh in in tremendous ways and uh, the ways that i can see and i'm sure there are ways that you're doing that i don't really necessarily see but uh you're doing great work and uh, you know uh yes um being a bangladeshi and being kind of um have done some things that may have um upset some of the mullahs and the government um i am actually uh, in, in not in a very good positions, but um, you know, with with the global kind of team or support that we get uh, from the that's actually overwhelming, and uh, uh, we wish mm -hmm. we we would achieve a a kind of a state of um, uh, and uh, the, the whole ex Muslims not being persecuted for their just leaving Islam business becomes a a a, a better situation, and you know. Uh, what you're trying to do uh, through this book is, is is really amazing, and I would I would request everybody to go and get this book. Uh, it's on Amazon, and uh, you know if you read this book, and not only that, you gift that book to a Muslim that you think are sitting on a fence, and who would actually yeah. uh, benefit from this the, the arguments and the you know it might just give them that little push they needed to you know go to the brighter side. Um, so it's really, really, uh, you know, great work. And I wish uh, there are more of a uh, 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 person like you who's, who's doing this sort of work. Um, and, uh, and and definitely, you know, ad, uh, admitting, 
heart meeting. What am I doing? Saying, uh, you know, accepting my my invitation to to come and join this discussion. And I'm, I'm hoping in future we would have you again for for a you know kind of a longer discussion about other issues, other things that uh, you know we we we, we think um, important for the for that moment. And you know, really appreciate you you coming. Absolutely, so, uh, and I, I wanted to one more thing is that. Uh, when people talk to me about this, this is blasphemy, and you know why are you saying this? Why are you so aggressive in this? I always tell them that we're just following the example of the Prophet, because you know when he was chased out of Mecca, he wasn't just chased out because he was being nice to people. He was very aggressive. He came back and he he smashed all the idols in the Kaaba when he came back. He didn't just type on a laptop or write a book or an article, and he actually went with a stick and he smashed all those idols. So there's uh, whenever I ask them, they, Jesus when he was crucified, you know, he crucified he was crucified because he was you know, uh, um, offending a lot of people. So whenever uh, the people ask me, like, you know, why are you doing all this stuff? I just tell them it's it's Sunnah the Rasul. Uh, okay, it. so we actually had two questions <laughs> since then. Um, Umair Ghori, uh -huh. I think, I don't know where it's from, but he's asking us to talk about Saudi Arabia, but I think we already covered that. I'm assuming, Umair, you just joined. Uh, this video is going to be saved on my timeline. It will go into... Uh, YouTube at a later date and I would recommend you go and watch that and there is a section we discuss Saudi Arabia in greater detail so you might actually get your answer there and Nazir Likas is saying is there an audiobook available yes there is um, Amazon has not only uh, it's also on iTunes uh, bookstore and also it's on Kindle so there is different versions of it and I think um, uh, they're really really nice to listen to as well and uh, um, you know, I, I definitely I placed my order order of the book just yesterday. It is dispatched. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me, but I'm sure it will be here tomorrow. And, and I'll definitely can't wait to use my uh, Christmas holiday to actually go through the book and then, you know, um, uh, buy a few more to to give to other other friends of mine. Um, so, uh, uh, Ali, uh, I don't know. I keep I don't I get confused between should I call you Rizvi? Should I call you Ali? You know, uh, but what would you prefer? Please call Ali? me Ali. Ali, Ali's Ali is fine. fine okay. yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Ali, again uh, to to join us and then you know share your wisdom and and you know discuss about the book. And I hope you have a really great rest of your weekend. And everybody who just watched it, um, I wish you a, a you know a, a happy seasonal holiday and a happy new year. And uh, if you are watching this, wherever you're watching this, I would recommend you sharing this with others, um, so that you know and subscribe and everything, so that you get to see other great discussions that we have in this channel we are um, the my channel and my whatever i'm doing is not something uh, a, a you know commercially motivated it's completely me there is no commercial interest and my interest is only to talk between uh, have a discussion which uh, are going to be enlightened to to the to the, whoever listens to it there is no agenda there is nothing it's just pure interest um for greater good that's all it is so thank you very much for joining in and we'll see you sometime uh, sometime again in future goodbye